you'll see that you have two envelopes in your bulletins. Uh, one is for our regular tithes and offerings uh, that take care of the day-to-day -day expenses of the ministry here. And then the other envelope is for our special building fund offering uh, as we continue to raise funds for the expansion of this church building so that we can expand the sanctuary. If you are unfamiliar with the plans, uh, we actually have them on the back wall of the church. So after service, stop by and take a look at that. And uh, we know that we continue to need your help with that. Uh, we've had some great testimonies of God's provision, uh, which has been so timely uh, because we're looking at uh, spending, having to spend a few thousand dollars this spring uh, in order to plant some additional screening plants uh, for our neighbors and whatnot to uh, keep the peace and uh, also to have a, a good thing in our favor as we go forward with this project. Also, to your bulletins, you'll see a little insert. Uh, just there were some concerns raised, and for the sake of our children, uh, please no smoking on the church grounds. Uh, that'll help a lot with, uh, you know, some were concerned that children might get the a wrong impression or whatnot. So if you could just avoid smoking on church grounds, if you do smoke, uh, that will be most helpful. Thank you. Today we're going to be having after service a special event for the children, our annual Easter egg hunt at the end of the service. Uh, I have a whole list of instructions. It's very long. Uh, but we're going to be uh, breaking the children up into age-appropriate groups. Uh, that way we don't have a 12-year-old uh, running ahead of a 2-year-old to get all the Easter eggs. Uh, we don't want to do that. Uh, so we're going to have them, the children meet downstairs. Uh, parents, please accompany your children. And the teachers are going to break the children up into different groups and actually have them do the Easter egg hunts on different locations on the church property. Uh, so we'll be sharing that a little bit later in the service. Hopefully I will remember to do that because I know if I share it now, no one will remember. I won't even remember. This morning I even forgot to put on my head mic, so I'm gonna have to go do that in a minute. But here's an important update before I forget this one too. I now have a new cell phone number, and it's there in the bulletin. Uh, so it's, it's there for you to use if you need to reach me. Uh, my old cell died a couple of weeks ago. It stopped being able to load minutes, and so it took me a while to shop around and find uh, the best product and the best package that would work for me. Uh, Sunday, April 15th, coming up in just a couple of weeks, we will be performing water baptisms. If you have never been water baptized by immersion, which was the model in the New Testament. Uh, some churches over time adopted sprinkling. Uh, partially that was because of the, as the church moved into Northern Europe during the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, because of the climate being so cold, it became difficult to practice immersion in December in Northern Germany. It just didn't work out very well. And then they also moved into practicing infant baptism which we don't do either, because everyone in the Bible who was water baptized, they were at least old enough to understand why they were being water baptized. And the reason for water baptism is that you have chosen to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And water baptism is a public symbol of that decision that you have made. So if you've never been water baptized by immersion since becoming a Christian, since believing in Jesus, uh, this is your opportunity to be so. Please sign up on that sheet in the foyer. Uh, please put down an email address because I will be emailing you some information that you will need as we go towards that day on Sunday the 15th. And so with that, let's stand together and would you turn to me in your Bibles, please? <laughs> turn to me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 27, and we're going to be reading at verse 57. Gospel of Matthew chapter 27, and we are beginning at verse 57. The Bible says, As evening approached, Joseph, a rich man from Arimathea, who had been a follower, who had become a follower of Jesus, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate issued an order to release it to him. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long sheet of clean linen cloth. He placed it in his own new tomb, which had been carved out of the rock. And then he rolled a great stone across the entrance and left. Both Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting across from the tomb and watching. The next day, on the Sabbath, the leading priests and Pharisees went to see Pilate. They told him, Sir, we remember that that deceiver once said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise from the dead. So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and then telling everyone that he was raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worse off than we were at first. Pilate replied, take guards and secure it as best you can. So they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the woman. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come, see where his body was lying, and now go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy, and they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, on this Resurrection Sunday, this day when we remember and honor and celebrate the greatest moment in human history. Lord, the culmination of your great plan of redemption and salvation for the human race. Lord, we as a race, as a people, we have chosen to walk away from you. Your word tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Your word says that all we like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. But you, Lord, have chosen to lay all of our sins upon your son, Jesus Christ. The one who lived as a perfect man so that our sins could be atoned for. Our guilt could be paid for. Our shame could be removed. And so that your righteousness could come upon us. And that when you look upon us, you do not see the stains of our sins, but instead you see the clean righteousness of Jesus Christ after we've chosen to believe in him by faith. Lord, we thank you, O God, that you have done this great work. And we remember our brothers and sisters who, because of sickness, are unable to be with us today. We pray, Lord, your hand of blessing to be upon them in a special, special way. We especially remember today our brother Frank Baird, that you would just minister to him and bless him. Lord, we pray for my son Nathan, who is homesick. Lord, we pray for any others who are ill today and absent from this body. 
We pray your hand of blessing to be with them. And we ask your anointing to be upon this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. What a wonderful Sunday. Happy Resurrection Day. Our Savior lives. Our Savior lives. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We serve an awesome God. We serve a great God. We serve the one and true living God. Amen.
our past. We're not the same. We have been changed. We have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And our Father lives. Amen. Our Savior lives. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's something to celebrate. Hallelujah. Forever and ever. We will be with the Father in heaven.
Yeah. 
We know that the ushers are going to be uh, working extra this morning uh, with everyone here, so I'm going to ask uh, Brother Dwayne Vogt to help us out as well now. Uh, if you are a first-time visitor here at Vineyard Assembly of God, this is your first time here, would you just slip up your hand and hold it right up because we have a gift for you. Uh, we have one right out in the foyer. Hallelujah. We've got some here. God bless you. Is there anyone else that this is your very first time? Hey, we've got some there in the foyer. Keep your hand up, please. We'll get you that gift. Lord, it's so good to see you today. We've got some more right up here, Brother Dwayne, uh, more towards the front. Just keep your hands up, folks. Keep them right up, and we'll get you that gift. Uh, we got some young people right here and right here in the front row. It's so good to see you. God bless you. We're glad to have you here. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Then we got one young man right back here. There he is. God bless you. Let's give all of our visitors a good hand clap of welcome. God bless you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And now let's have all of our children come forward to be dismissed for Children's Church. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. They're still going. It's incredible. It's great. <laughs> All these children, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Praise God. It's so awesome to see young families in the church, young families with children, you know, bringing their children to church and 
wanting God. Uh, that was something that my mother especially always did for myself and my two younger brothers and two younger sisters. Uh, my mother always made sure that we were in church and the home church that I grew up in, uh, we had two services on a Sunday morning as the church grew and uh, my mother would take us to the early service at 8 a.m. And uh, the way my family is, my family believes in the adage that early is on time, on time is late, and late is inexcusable. So consequently, we were in church around 7.30 on a Sunday morning. And my mother, who is barely just over five feet tall, somewhere like this, she would get five kids out of bed on a Sunday morning, get us up, get us dressed, get us out the door, and get us to church by 7.30 in the morning. And she instilled in us not just the habit of duty for it, but somehow she conveyed to us a love of God in it. And you know, I'm the only one out of my brothers and sisters that God decided to call into ministry, and that's, that's fine, that's up to him. But every one of my brothers and sisters are serving God right now in the church. You know, in fact, one of my younger brothers, he's on the church board of the church I used to pastor in upstate New York. It's amazing what God can do. So parents, Liz and I, we've got three of them. We know what it's like on Sunday mornings. But I want to encourage you, parents, with this word. Don't be weary in well-doing. For in due time, you will reap a harvest. Keep putting in that good seed into your children. Keep praying for them. And keep believing God that he's going to grab a hold of their lives as well. Praise the Lord. I'm going to be speaking today to you from a couple of passages from two of the Gospels. I won't read them at the beginning because they are a little bit extensive, but I'll read them as we go through the message today. But I've entitled this message, The Empty Gifts of Jesus. The Empty Gifts of Jesus. And I chose this title deliberately for its thought value. And I saw already in some of your faces, as soon as I said, the empty gifts of Jesus, I saw that look come that says, Pastor, where are you going with this one now? I chose it to provoke thought for you, and I think that all of us would probably feel, it's Easter Sunday, <clears throat> but let's think back to Christmas. How would you react if you were opening your gift on Christmas morning, you see the nice shiny present there and you unwrap it and there's a box and you open the box and there's nothing in the box? You would probably feel like somebody just played a really bad joke on you, wouldn't you? Normally we think of empty as something very, very negative. My refrigerator is empty. My gas tank is empty. My stomach is empty. My checkbook, my bank account is empty. Those are all negative things, right? Those are all things that we don't want to have empty. We don't want our refrigerator empty. We don't want the gas tank on our car or truck empty. We don't want our stomachs to be empty. We don't want our checkbook or our bank account to be empty. But we forget that sometimes, just on occasion, empty can be very empty very positive. Empty sometimes can be very, very good. Let me tell you this true story. In his book, The Fall of Fortresses, Elmer Bendiner related this true story from World War II. 
from his service as a navigator on a B-17 bomber over Europe during World War II. Elmer, as the navigator, he was flying a mission, a bombing mission, over the German city of Kassel. And the way the British and Americans worked together as allies during that part of the war when they were bombing German cities and German industry, the British would bomb during the night and the American Air Force would bomb during the day. And that way it was just constant bombing happening over German cities to try and get Nazi Germany to surrender, to stop the war. And so Elmer is in this B-17 in daylight over the German city of Kassel. And of course, German anti-aircraft was some of the best in the world at the time. And so the Germans were firing up at this massive formation of hundreds of B-17 bombers over the city of Kassel. And Elmer's airplane was hit by 11 20 millimeter shells all directly into the fuel tank of the airplane. Not one of those shells exploded. The fuel tank never blew up. Had that happened, that airplane would have been disintegrated over that city, and no doubt Elmer and the other nine men on board that airplane would have all died over that German city. As it was, they were able to complete their bombing mission and return to England to their base. And when they landed, they told their ground crew, we got hit. Can you check this out? And so the ground crew went and they inspected the airplane and they have to repair the airplane. And they looked and they found where those 11 20 millimeter shells had gone into the fuel tank and had lodged inside the metal of the fuel tank. The ground crew had to call the ordnance disposal crew to come in and take out these shells, lest they explode. You couldn't just go in there with a hammer and try and knock these things out, because they might go off. So the ordnance disposal men came and they carefully removed one shell, then they removed another, and another, and another, and another, and they began to notice something strange. There wasn't a problem with these shells. So the ordnance guys took the fuses out of the shells and looked inside these 20 millimeter shells and every one of those shells was empty. There was no explosive in those shells, except for one shell. One shell had something in it, but it wasn't explosive. It was a little scrap of piece of paper and written on it in a scrawl, a quick scrawl in the Czech language, which they got translated, were the words, this is all we can do for you now. You see, the Nazi war machine was using slave labor in their factories to make their weapons. And some of these slave laborers were from Czechoslovakia, they were Czechs. And what they chose to do, their only way of resisting the Nazi war machine while they were making these 20 millimeter shells for the German anti-aircraft guns was to make sure they didn't put any explosive in the shells. See, sometimes an empty gift can be a life-saving gift. In the case of Elmer Benadir, sometimes an empty gift can be not just life-saving, but life-changing and life-renewing. He survived the war, was able to return to the United States, got married, raised a family, and became an author, and eventually wrote the book containing the story that I just shared with you today. Amen. Now, I share that story to set the platform, to set the stage for this message about the empty gifts of Jesus being something very, very positive. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, as I prepare to preach this message to your people, Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be here, 
not only to help me to preach this message in the way, in the tone, in the, the gestures, everything, the words, the phrases that you want me to say, but that, Lord, you would prepare your people to not only hear this message with their ears and understand it with their minds, but, Lord, let your people also grip it with their hearts. Let this message grip into our hearts and into our souls so that we are transformed today, all of us, by the empty gifts of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for the gift of the Holy Spirit, which enables us to minister. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to look first at John chapter 19. And we're going to read verses 28 through 30. And then we're going to skip down to verse 38 and read verse 38 through 42. So John chapter 19, the Gospel of John chapter 19, beginning at verse 28, talking about Jesus on the cross. And it says, Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Later, Joseph of Arimathea, this is now down to verse 38, Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in, in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This passage records how Joseph of Arimathea received permission from the Roman governor Pontius Pilate to remove Jesus' body from the cross and give it a decent burial. Now, I want to share with you this first of the empty gifts of Jesus. That first empty gift is an empty cross. And it's the empty cross of Jesus is a gift to remind us that it is finished. Just as Jesus said on the cross, he said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. It is finished. Now, if you were in Edgartown and you happen to see somebody running up and down on those brick sidewalks in Edgartown shouting, it is finished, it is finished. You would probably want to know what is finished. There's a level of curiosity that would be induced by that. And Jesus, when Jesus said, it is finished, <clears throat> he wasn't talking about his life. It's finished, I'm done. And then he died. Jesus was talking about the reason why he had to go to the cross to begin with. It says in Hebrews 9.28, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Jesus was sacrificed once once on the cross. He didn't have to keep going to the cross again and again and again and again. He only had to go once. And when he said it is finished and they took his body off, he gave us the gift of an empty cross, not an occupied cross. 
Jesus finished doing the will of God, the Father, on the cross. Jesus finished removing the guilt of our sins on the cross. Jesus finished fulfilling his role as the second Adam on the cross. You think, okay, I kind of understand, Pastor, about doing the will of God the Father. This was all God the Father's great plan to save us of our sins. Uh, I understand about Jesus removing our guilt while he was on the cross. I get that. But what is this about Jesus being the second Adam? What is that? The first Adam was given a perfect world, yet he failed God at a tree. The second Adam, Jesus, was born into an imperfect world, yet he succeeded on a tree. There's a parallel there in scripture. There's a link there between what happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam, our first parent, failed God and brought sin to all of us and sin to this world and what Jesus did on the cross when he honored God and obeyed God completely. Where Adam failed, Jesus succeeded. And that's why Jesus is called the second Adam. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, so it is written. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The Bible says that by Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Jesus, didn't he say when he walked on this earth, didn't Jesus say, I am come to bring you life and that more abundantly. You see, what we really have now isn't life. We really don't have life right now. We're just waiting for death. Say, boy, that's a really exciting and uplifting thought today, Pastor. Thank you for sharing that with me. But it's true, isn't it? You look at pictures from a hundred years ago or more, and you look at all these people. Like a few years ago, my brother and I and my wife and his wife and a few others, we went to Ellis Island, and we stood on Ellis Island in New York Harbor 100 years to the day that my great-great-grandfather arrived on the SS Abraham Lincoln from Germany in 1912. And Ellis Island, if you've ever been there, is now a museum and it's got all these pictures of these ships that came from Europe and the ships were just full of people immigrating into the United States. And you look at those pictures and you realize every one of these people, including the little babies held in mother's arms, are now dead. And barring the return of Jesus for us, one day every one of us is going to die. So when Jesus says, I came to bring you life and life more abundantly, he wasn't talking about this life. He's talking about the life that comes after this life. The life of eternal life that he gives us and promises us. When Jesus was on that cross and he said, it is finished, he didn't say it as a groan. It was a shout of complete victory. We would say today, if Jesus were on the cross today in our modern time, he probably wouldn't say it is finished. He would probably say mission accomplished (laughs) because that's what he meant. It's wonderful, Pastor. But what does that mean to me today? It means today that when Jesus said, it is finished, when Jesus, in a sense, said, mission accomplished, it means that Jesus has already won the war. We just have to fight our battles. That's all. Jesus has already won the war. 
We just have to fight our battles. Herman Melville wrote in the book Moby Dick, which is actually one of my favorites. I've got like three versions of the movie too. He writes these words talking about the nature of evil in this world. He says, the malignant thing that has plagued mankind since time began, the thing that maws and mutilates our race, not killing us outright, but letting us live on with half a heart and half a lung. And you know, there was Herman Melville writing that, and as far as I know, he wasn't a Christian. But yet he understood, he saw what had happened to the human race. He understood somewhere in his heart that this is not how life on this world was intended to be. And he understood that there was a force of evil in this world that hates the human race and that does everything it can to cripple the human race through the effects of evil and sin. That malignant force is Satan and his demons. And why does Satan hate humanity so much? Because Satan saw at the very beginning that God created us, male and female, in the image and likeness of God. And his desire was to be like God. And he saw that God put his likeness not on him, where he thought it was deserved, but on people like you and I. And so he brought temptation and he brought sin and with that sin came defeat. And with that defeat came all kinds of disease and pain and death into this world. But 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God that he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That means that any battle against any addiction, any battle against any discouragement or depression, any battle against any temptation, any battle against any sin, any battle against hurts and wounds and abuses and regrets and sorrows and grief, any battle against the memories of past failures, any battle that we face can be fought by faith in God knowing that you can win because he has already won. We praise God for that. When the war is won, the soldiers get to go home. Jesus won the war on the cross, and that's why he left the cross empty for us. As a sign, he won the war. He got to go home. And the day is coming when each and every one of us who are following Jesus by faith, we're going to get to go home because our home isn't here on Martha's Vineyard. Our home isn't here on this earth. Our home is with God for all eternity in a new heaven, in a new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. That's what we have to look forward to. The empty cross is a victorious cross. And we give God the glory for that. Let's look at Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 8 now. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. The Bible says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners to be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. 
See, not only did Jesus leave us with an empty cross as a gift, he left us with an empty tomb as a gift. And the empty tomb of Jesus is a gift to remind us that he is not there. He has risen. What a reminder. Now, what's funny is that everyone agrees. Everyone agrees. Christians, Jews, Muslims, even atheists, all agree that Jesus lived, that he taught, that he was crucified, and that he was buried. Everyone agrees about that. But the key point is where people don't agree. Where people disagree is whether or not Jesus was resurrected from the dead. That's the make or break line where we go our separate ways. You see, whether or not Jesus was raised from the dead is such an important point that the Bible itself admits that there is no Christianity if Jesus was not raised from the dead. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. I mean, what a statement. The Bible itself says that if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead, that everything that we are and that we do as Christians is completely useless. It's worthless. Because everything about our Christianity hangs on this one point, whether or not that tomb is empty. Whether or not Jesus did indeed rise from the dead. So you see, the Bible isn't afraid to admit that the entire Christian faith rests on a single historical event. An event that must be a verifiable fact. This is why people work so hard to try and prove that the resurrection didn't happen. Why archaeologists are even looking now trying to find the tomb of Jesus, hoping that they find bones in there with his name on them. Because if they can prove that he's still in the tomb, then everything about the Christian gospel goes away. We're not sinners. We're just prone to mistakes. We weren't created in the image of likeness of God. We just, we're, we're naked monkeys. We lost our hair and we got some brains and we built rockets and buildings. And if there's no God and there's no sin, and God didn't create us, and there's, we only just evolved by blind chance, then we just live our lives, and when we die, we become compost for the next generation. And there's no accountability. And so I can live my life how I want. I can do what I want. And you know that sounds like freedom, but that's the worst form of emptiness there is. Richard Dawkins, noted atheist and author, he wrote, Faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is belief in spite of, even perhaps because of, the lack of evidence. But there's tremendous evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. There's so much evidence that it is possible to verify that Jesus did indeed rise from the dead, just as the Bible says. In fact, author Jack Zavada in 2017 gave seven proofs of the resurrection, and I'm going to give them to you very quickly today. Number one, the first proof is the empty tomb. See, one of the arguments that people say is, well, Jesus' disciples, they forgot where they buried him. And they went to the wrong tomb. They went to an empty tomb. And they went, oh, he must have risen from the dead. 
And that started Christianity. Now, I don't know about you, but if you care about somebody, you tend not to forget where you bury them. I can take any one of you across the ferry, up 495, onto the Mass Pike, west into New York, onto the New York Thruway, get off on exit 27, go into the city of Amsterdam, New York, take Route 5 heading back east until you get to the exit for Widow Susan Road, turn north on Widow Susan Road, take you to St. John the Baptist Cemetery, drive and park the car and walk you to my grandfather's grave. I know where he's buried. Because I love that man, and I also had the privilege of preaching his funeral. And I stood at that graveside in the internment ceremony. People don't forget where they bury people they love. The disciples, they didn't forget where they buried Jesus. In fact, they knew where he was buried, even if they did happen to vaguely forget, well, where is that tomb in this garden? All they had to do was look for a squadron of Roman soldiers in a tomb that happened to be sealed with the seal of the Roman governor. And they'd know where it was. The high priests knew where it was. The Roman soldiers knew where it was. Everybody knew where the tomb of Jesus was. So everybody knew when the tomb was empty. The second proof is the Gospels record that the first eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection were women. You say, why is that important? Well, 2,000 years ago, women were regarded as second class human beings by Jewish culture, by Roman culture, by Greek culture. In fact, so much so that women's testimony in court was inadmissible. So in this culture, if the disciples were faking the resurrection of Jesus and making this up as a story, they would have made sure that about 20 men showed up in writing this story to say, oh, the tomb is empty, he is risen indeed, because then everybody would have believed that testimony. But instead, they recorded the facts as it truly happened, that it was women who went to the tomb first and found out that Jesus was raised from the dead first. Even though in that culture at that time, nobody wanted to listen to a woman. That's an indication that the Gospels weren't faked, that they're not fiction. Then number three, there's the apostles' new courage. When Jesus was arrested and crucified and buried, the apostles were terrified. They scattered. They hid. But suddenly, after Easter Sunday, three days after Jesus was crucified, they become bold preachers about Jesus. What happened? How do you go from being terrified to being bold in three days about the same person? It's because they were convinced he was raised from the dead. Then there's the changed life of James, number four. James was Jesus' half-brother. Before the crucifixion, James actually went with Mary and some of Jesus' other half-brothers and sisters to go get Jesus and take him home because they thought he had lost his mind. They wanted to take him home and put him in a nice bed and let him rest for a while. James openly doubted who Jesus was. But after Easter Sunday, he suddenly becomes a complete believer in Jesus and becomes a leader of the Jerusalem church. How does somebody make that change? It's because they were convinced that he was raised from the dead. Then there was the number five, the large crowd of eyewitnesses. Over 500 people saw Jesus alive after his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 6 even states that the majority were still alive when the Apostle Paul was writing 1 Corinthians. So the Apostle Paul was literally saying, if you doubt what I'm writing, go look these people up and ask. If the internet was invented, then he would say, go Google them. You know, he would have he shared their Facebook Then number six, there's the conversion of Paul himself. Paul started out as a persecutor of Christians. 
But suddenly he became the greatest missionary evangelist of all times. Why? Because he had an encounter with Jesus raised from the dead. And then finally, number seven, the earliest apostles, they all died for Jesus. You know what? People don't die for something they know is a lie. If the apostles had gotten together in a little room and said, hey, I got this idea for a really great story. Let's come up with this story. Tell everybody Jesus was raised from the dead. We'll make our own religion and we'll make a nice, easy living off of all the offerings that are going to come in. You know, the moment the persecution started, they would have said, you know, hey, bye, see ya. They would have cut and run again, but they didn't. They were all willing to die for the one that they knew who was alive. The Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir wrote this song and sang this song. There's a feeling in the air that God is everywhere and his resurrection power is moving in this hour that Jesus might be glorified. I will glorify the name of the Lord. I will glorify his name and his resurrection power is moving in this hour that Jesus might be glorified. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We don't have faith because Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. We have faith in the one true living God because Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. It says in Romans chapter 8 verses 10 through 11, but if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit that lives in you. You know what that means? That means that be only because Jesus is alive, only because he is alive, that when you face death, there is hope for life. That when you face defeat, there is hope for victory. When you face discouragement, there is hope for encouragement. When you face distress, there is hope for peace. When you face disaster, there is hope for purpose. When you face disease, there is hope for healing because Jesus is alive. The empty tomb of Jesus is a gift, a sign that God intends us to live life through his life. Think about that. To live life now through his life, his resurrected life. You know what that means? You know what that means? That means that you can have beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. It means that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. It means that you shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. It means that in him you live and move and have your being. It means that in him we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Jesus gave us two empty gifts, an empty cross and an empty tomb so that our lives, our hearts, our souls, our futures would be full of him. Let's stand together, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.
We're going to remember Jesus today and what he did for us by celebrating the Lord's Supper. And the emblems of the Lord's Supper are open to anyone who believes that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. Now these emblems, this bread and this grape juice, by drinking them, by eating them, you're not going to get into heaven. They're not going to give you any grace. They're just symbols. They represent what already should be in our hearts. But I want to give you an opportunity that if you've never made a decision to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and that decision means you realize, hey, I'm a sinner, but I realize that Jesus, he's God, and he died in my place taking my guilt with him so that I could have his righteousness. If you believe that, if you're choosing to believe that, then you become a Christian. You ask God to forgive you of your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I just want to ask today if there's anyone here who today, and I'm not going to embarrass you, I'm not going to make you come up front or anything like that, but I am going to ask you that if you're making a decision for Jesus today, all you got to do is put your hand up and say, yep, that's me. That's it. God bless you, brother. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 That's all you got to do. Just put your hand up and say, yep, that's me. I'm believing in Jesus. God bless you, sister. Hallelujah. 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 God is so awesome. He is so good. His grace is sufficient for us. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to distribute the emblems of the Lord's Supper as Paris and Allie lead us in song. And I'm going to ask if uh, Ed could help us and uh, Dominic, if you could come and help us. If uh, Emily, could you help us too today? And if uh, Robert, if you could come help us distribute the emblems of the Lord's Supper. Head, Paris and Alley, you can lead us. Hallelujah.
Usually when we celebrate the emblems of the Lord's Supper, we remember what Jesus did on the night when he was betrayed. During the Last Supper, the Bible says he took bread and he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, this is my body. Eat it. Do this in remembrance of me. And the Bible says he took a cup and he gave it to his disciples and he told them to drink it all. And he said, this is my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. This do in remembrance of me. And that's a solemn occasion. And it's appropriate that we remember the solemnity of what God himself had to do to rescue us. But today's Resurrection Sunday. So I want to read something different to you today from Romans chapter 8. Right at the end of the chapter, there are these words. And I want us to remember these words as we remember what Jesus did for us. Because not only did he go to the cross, but he came off that cross and he came out of that tomb. It says... No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's what we have as Christians. That's why as Christians, we of all people should be the most joyful people, the most alive people, the most at peace people. That's not to say that we walk around in a, in a haze, you know, never having a problem in life. In fact, we're going to have problems. But it's how we handle those problems that make the difference. We are more than conquerors. Not out of ourselves, not of our, out of our own willpower or our own intellectual education or our own psychological strength. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, as each of us hold here in our hands these simple emblems, that symbolize your perfect body, unleavened bread without yeast, representing a life lived without sin, and this cup of grape juice representing your blood. Lord God, you gave yourself fully and completely to us so that we could live with you. There is no greater love than that. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you this morning. And we receive these emblems by faith in gratitude for what you have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's partake together. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Let's give God some thanks today. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
Hallelujah. As we close this service, I just want to give you now some instructions about the Easter egg hunt for all of our children.